The Celtic Exchange, a fresh insight on Celtic Football Club. This is episode 74 of the Celtic Exchange Weekly. This is Tino and this week I'm joined by Miffin Parry as Celtic make it two wins from two on a tricky day in Dingle to maintain their place at the top of the Scottish Premiership table. Miff, a wee bit of huffing and puffing at the Global Energy Stadium but we got there in the end. We certainly did, Tino. Hello Tino, hello Paddy, hello listeners. <laughs> Check this out man, I've just realised. Nice. Twins. Come on man. Twins, twins, aye, aye, aye. twins, aye, aye. <laughs> That one's for Sinky. Aye. Um, Hello, sorry, uh, a wee bit of sidetracked there, Tino. Yes, a bit of huffing and puffing. Um, however, job done, and all in all, a far more stable start to the season than what we experienced last year. We seem to be in some sort of groove already. You can see that the team that Anne just preferring to put out in the park. You can see that the pattern of play is well established. Um, yeah, for me, reasons to be cheerful. Nice. Paddy, you and I done the pre-match show for this one. Uh, that went out on Friday at the Celtic Exchange Plus, and you predicted a 3-0 win to Celtic. You were close enough, eh? I and and do you know something? I think the performance that I kind of spoke up near the end of that um, post chat was basically saying that you know it would be a, a comfortable, confident victory. And I, I take what obviously what the press want to say about things. I still think it was um, mm. looked very comfortable. We've seen some some things for the players and kind of saying you know that they just they just know that they need to just trust this process and keep going. And uh, it's evident on on Saturday. Good. Good performance for them. Yeah, and three ones a solid win. But Miff, you and I were chatting earlier on. You're a wee bit spiky about how the the media have reported Celtic's win. Spiky, yes. Um, I just feel that there is a, a kind of undercurrent of almost playing down um, how how Celtic are playing for the point of view of you you could argue if you were of a certain persuasion that Celtic were rescued on on Saturday, but I don't feel that was the case. Um, I, I didn't manage to watch the game. I, I wasn't able to get the old. Uh, Dar pirate stream, um, so I just put up with, with Sky Sports News in, instead and watched my coupon slowly fade away. And uh, Mark Benstead was was fairly, you know, he, he was reporting on the game, and that was all I had heard at the time. And it was really a case of when, not if Celtic were going to score, control the game. Said my aid, I should have scored. I really had been close, etc., etc. And then even after it went to one each, Celtic really turned the screw. In search for the for the the winning goal, they lo and behold the the kind of match report, and, and I'm going to reference it. It's the BBC BBC Sport website was, I mean, it seemed to focus more on just how organised Ross County were rather than the fact that Celtic had dominated the game, created a lot of chances, and ultimately ran out comfortable winners. That that's my chosen narrative on it. Whether people agree with me or not is up to them. I don't know if that is in any way connected to the fact that the BBC themselves have recently reconciled with, with Rangers. Um, it, that's why we're paranoid, etc., etc. But, but for me, you know, these these are the type of things that have effectively led to podcasts like us being in creation because people want to hear it from a, a Celtic point of view. Um, not that the BBC are obliged to do that; they're obliged to be neutral mm-hmm. in, in in instances. But for me, that it's almost treating you like you're stupid. That's the bit I don't like. And and to me, it's clearly, obviously, trying to create a narrative that quite simply doesn't exist. Yeah. My few chances are featured on Sports Scene with Stephen Thompson, Shelley Kerr, Ricky Foster, or they're dwindling by the week. Sounds like a good thing. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty disappointing. Yeah. It's pretty disappointing. What's your take, Barry, just on the, the media noise after the, the weekend's results? Yeah, I can kind of... I, I'd agree with Miff on it. I think um, I'm reading a few tweets over the weekend basically talking about even sports scenes coverage of the game was a lot less than what you know was shown at Ibrox as well and it's it's maybe just part of the deal that's been struck up for the early days just to kind of you know massage the ego of Rangers again under that deal um, but you know as much as it can annoy the likes of us it's not going to take away from the fact that that's a that is a solid start to the season for us and I'm, I'm still yet to, to kind of see any, any major worries from from this, this start of living. If anything, they're only going to get stronger. So, good start for us. I think we, we said in the, the, the pre-match, you know, that it was going to be quite a a difficult one. But if we were firing all cylinders, we could have possibly taken maybe more than three of them, you know. Um, but I, I generally think that they, 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 they do set up well. That's why they had such a good season last year. Mm-hmm. 
but we still scored three goals against them. Yeah. So and quite comfortably. So nah, good performance and can ignore that lot. Just on the whole uh, score prediction thing, mm-hmm. was there any other predictions for last week on the podcast? That... <sighs> Tell me. Did you call it? Did you call yes, it? You two won. for two? Two one. Well, according to Sinclair, I can't remember. Well done. You know. <laughs> so in this week's show, we'll cover that trip to the Highlands as Celtic recovered from a Ross County equaliser to take all three points back to Glasgow. We'll also chat through the latest noise coming from the transfer market with just a few weeks or so to go before that slam shut, my f- slam shut. We'll then have a look at the ongoing improvements we're seeing under Ange, and in particular from guys like Greg Taylor who have fully bought into his methods. And finally, we'll look ahead to Sunday's trip to Rugby Park as Celtic face newly promoted Kilmarnock in match day three of the Scottish Premiership. So on to Sunday's game, uh, Saturday's game, sorry, against Ross County. And the big news pre-match was that Maurice Jens would be making his debut alongside Cameron Carter-Vickers in the centre of defence after C- Stephen Welsh unfortunately took on well on training, at training on Friday. My a shame for Welsh, he'd started the season well, obviously got that opening goal against Aberdeen the week before, but what was your verdict on Jens and how he performed? Well again, I'm, I'm only going by what I heard and then partially what I saw in the, the highlights, but um, he has the, the look of an accomplished defender. Um, he's young, we've got the option to buy, which which bodes well. We know Ange doesn't really like disruption to his centre-half pairing, so... Mm. What I would suggest to me is that he's come in, he's made an impression, and and the jersey, unfortunately for Stephen Welsh, is now his. Um, I I wouldn't imagine that if Welsh is fit, he would go and put him straight back in. Because I think it is pretty marginal between Welsh and Jens, to be perfectly honest. To go up to Ross County, I mean, we've we've conceded from a corner. Um, It looked a fairly tame goal on on the television at at the time when it was being reported. Uh, Mark Benstead had said that he thought Joe Hart could have done better on seeing the the goal on television. There is a Ross County player impairing his view just yeah. before it who moves out the way. It does look a soft header, but uh, again, he's, he's not really time to react, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be overly critical of that. Yeah, I don't I don't think Hart can do much. It comes at him at pace from very short distance. For me, actually, he ends up at Week at the goal, to be honest with you. I think uh, the Yakaviti that scored the goal, and he's about, you know, all over him, you know, arms and elbows and all that kind of stuff but that's Jens is six foot whatever I think it's his job to deal with that so overall good game composed gets his goal but maybe could be doing better there in terms of his goal Paddy he described that as the proudest moment of his career so far he was speaking to Celtic TV after the game and I think you can see he's delighted to be here and he'll be looking to grab this opportunity with both hands well absolutely Um, and I think that the the reaction the celebration speaks volumes on it Uh, the scenes that it basically caused and you know what it meant for the fans, because as fans, you know, you, you start to get a bit worried when the, the minutes are ticking down and you think it's maybe just not going to be our day today. Not that anything was wrong with the football, but you see that re- release, that euphoria from the players as well. Um, after, the, you know, all their methods that they've, they've, they've played with for that full 90 minutes and it, and it pays off. Um, so there was a bit of relief for, the, for their side as well. And again, it's not as if we've escaped with anything there. It's, it's because what they've been trying to implement has worked. Just that that's the very the very thing I would say, Paddy, and, and to reference the point we've already made about how, how the game was reported. It's for me the most important aspect to that is the fact that we have been relentless against what is a, a stubborn opposition yeah. or a stubborn opponent, should I say. Um that that to me is the, the very obvious takeaway. The defending champions continuing their relentless domestic run mm-hmm. and showing that they have a spirit which quite simply says we, we don't want to drop points. Yeah. Now, had they had they dropped points, you, then that's when you laud County absolutely mm-hmm. for, a, for a dogged display and that, that's what they do. They've done it to us before, pretty sure they'll do it to us again. Right. Mm-hmm. But that that's testament to them and the way that they've set up and I'm taking nothing away from them. You know, I'd seen another argument for you and Murray on Twitter. I hate to even reference him on the podcast, but basically saying that Celtic and Rangers fans, for that matter, shouldn't celebrate victories, which is quite an interesting take. Just um, a big off, mate. Uh, however, the the fact is Celtic won the game, and they won the game because of that attitude, because of that drive, because of the way they are coached to continue to play that style of football. And the third goal was as a result of Greg Taylor being so far up the park that he's able to press the opposition centre half into making a mistake and then contribute to the goal mm-hmm. taking place that that is the, the the big takeaway from me is that relentless spirit within the team yeah there's definitely a bit of trust the process going on there you know it doesn't matter if you score the winner 
in the first half or in the very final kick of the ball and I suppose Anthony Ralston up at uh, Dingwall last time out last year shows you that it can happen in the 97th minute if need be but Celtic get into the final 10 minutes there's a wee bit of anxiety but I still wasn't particularly nervous because you know that we're going to create chance after chance after chance and we don't just get the second goal we go and get the third and as you say Muff the goals have come about the, for me the goals have come about because of how Ange wants me to play the second goal is a, is by a result of a quick free kick Jota gets it puts it down quickly taps it to Taylor who gives it back and he whips it in if you don't take the quick free kick that Ange wants you to take or the quick corner kick sorry and you maybe just go and you swing it to the back post and you see what happens you might or you might not score but we've got to go because we've done what we do. We take everything sharp. The moment the ball's out of play, we get it back in. So that's a direct result for goal two. And for goal three, you're absolutely right. Greg Taylor leading the charge, pressing their defender. So he's one of our defenders, but he's up there pressing their defender, harrying and harassing him. And all of a sudden it breaks. And there's a couple of passes between Taylor, uh, Abada, out to Jota, back to Abada goal. And it's all as a result of this relentless high press. So the players should continue to trust the process because the proof's in the pudding week after week that it's bringing results yeah yeah, uh, three great goals as well three really really good goals that, talking about the second one the, the ball in brilliant you yeah. just eat that up every day don't you it's just uh, a, a great ball a I great think, ball I think I'd seen a still photo and it's the height that Jens get on it's easy when you're six foot odds but the height he gets up Mm-hmm. above just any of the opposition defenders it's just a notable leap which, which bodes well I know he's maybe like sealed in a wee bit for the goal but what you need to remember is first game only got to improve you know hopefully build a partnership with, with Carter Vickers um, it, Jota we mentioned that at the start of the season when, when it's confirmed that he was signing permanently we knew we'd seen him last season we'd seen glimpses if you've got him fit a pre-season and, and, and we're already seeing that bear fruit I mean the guy is just a, a wonderful, wonderful footballer. He is an absolute game changer in every sense of the word. So, you know, in terms of what he brought to the game, so a hat track of assists, another man of the match performance to follow up from the one that he picked up last week by Aberdeen. And as you say, Paddy, I think all three goals are very, very good goals. And if you look at them from a, a Jota point of view, in terms of what he's brought to them, mm-hmm. they're real quality, but in very different ways. So the first goal, it's great dribbling. Initially out in the touchline, he nutmegs a guy, brings it into McGregor, continues his run into the box, could have maybe gone down for a penalty. He stays on his feet. Perfect cutback for Kugo. And Kugo does the rest. For the second goal, I've just spoke about it. The quick corner. It's Jota that takes the corner. It's Jota that whips in. It's 2-1 Celtic. And for the third goal, it's just a very quick and incisive first touch pass back into Abada. Yeah. And it's 3-1 and it's done and dusted. And Jota is the game changer. Celtic have scored five league goals so far. Jota's contributed to four of them. And what's interesting about that, impressive as it is, aside from that, all of his creation is coming off the left-hand side. So yeah. if you look at the three chances from Saturday and the goal that he scored against Aberdeen, he's coming in from the left. Now what's interesting and what I'd like to put to you lads is that Ange, Ange loves Dyes and Maeda. Mm-hmm. Right? He is the epitome of an Ange Postacoglu side. And more often than not, Maeda starts. And he'd started on Saturday, he started on the left. But when Jota gets over there, he is terrifying yeah. for the fences. And what do you think about the fact that, yes, Maeda gives you everything in terms of setting the tone and the work rate, but are we a better side with Jot on the left and perhaps a bad on the right? Um, I, I, I wouldn't know. I think it's maybe just too early for that to, to, to kind of to, to kind of judge that one, Tino. Just I'd, speculate, Paddy, just make I'll, something up. I would actually like to see Maeda maybe being tried out on the right. Yeah, um, why not? I'm, and the reason I say that is just, as much as obviously, you know, Jota will pull a, a defence in a midfield all over the park, um, especially the left and the right, um, but more so on the left. We, we know how comfortable he is, and he was great for us there last season. But what what I think Maeda also brings is that he presses so high up the park and puts defenders under a lot of pressure, as does Kyogo. And, and, and what you're finding there is that the team look ready to pounce. You watch the likes of um, the game against Aberdeen, anytime there was a bit of pressing, O'Reilly, Hatati, they were all there to pick up the scraps and it's something they work on um, and I just think that will get better in time for this season, I really do yeah. um, however Abada just again makes everything, it's a great headache to have, like he, he's come on what what a finish, yeah. what a great goal brilliant finish um, and he's he's well worth starting as well, absolutely yeah. in terms of the Maeda stuff, I have to follow on from what Paddy's saying, he just, he sets the tone and often he's the first one to press and it puts serious pressure on defenders and all of a sudden they panic and that's when 
Jota and Kyogo and O'Reilly and Hatati and all these guys then you kind of bring up the rear if you like mm-hmm. to, to catch up anything that's been spilled um, what do you think Miff? I mean if we've got a cup final tomorrow do you go Maeda do you go Abada I, I wouldn't be adverse to trying Maeda on the right to be honest with you I think what's became very apparent and I would agree with Pad it was the same even with his pre-season performances with Jota on the left is a, a different proposition it would appear so your problem or your issue or your quandary, whatever way you want to term it, then becomes who do I play on the right rather than where do I play Jota, where do I play Maeda? It becomes who do I play on the right? Mm-hmm. Then it's a straight shootout between three players, Forrest, Maeda and Abada. Um, I would, I'd probably stick with Maeda personally. I'd, I, I'm, I'm in no rush to jettison him out of the team. Um, there seems to be a, a small number of fans who, who just aren't having him. Uh, I think that's a bit harsh. Uh, I, th- I think you, you will see that over the course of a season they'll majorly contribute to the mm-hmm. team more often than not. Uh, however, Abada seems to just have that X factor about him. I've mentioned it many, many times before. He's not scared to make a mistake. He's not scared. You know, he can scuff the ball at the park one minute and then produce a, a real moment of quality the next. That's the type of player he is. I'm completely at peace with that. I'm happy to take the 50 50 gamble that you get with him mm-hmm. when he's on the park. You know, he's a young player. He's only got to get better. Um, for me, it would still be Maeda based on the fact that just Ange likes him and he's obviously carrying out very specific instructions. But I don't think we're any weaker with a batter. Yeah. And I think, I suppose Celtic could continue to do what they have been doing, Paddy, switching mid game. So mm-hmm. often you'll see them line up with Maeda on the left, Jot on the right, and then 20 minutes in, you know, they've flipped it across and that's the way it goes. Maeda picked up a knock, so you'll have seen the chance that he, he's got on the end of right on the half half time whistle. He's been unlucky, actually. It's a very good effort, a very kind of um, clever effort, but he's picked up a knock. So it might well be that Abada steps in mm-hmm. by default. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Um, in terms of the goal Celtic have conceded, we've covered it lightly in terms of, I think Jens was potentially a, potentially a bit flat footed there. And it's another goal he conceded from a corner, and there's a wee bit of frustration in that. I would say the, the bigger frustration for me was the weak tackle in the midfield that led to it. There was a couple of tackles where we, we should have been a bit firmer. Yeah. The ball goes out the park, you know, for a, a throw further up the park, you're probably able to get back into a structure and defend it. Instead, what happened, it kind of bobbled about. I think it was down to um, Ariely and possibly Turnbull. Or I, I can't remember if it was him or, or McGregor was involved. It's be, and we talk about a genuine number six, somebody that's got to go in there, almost a kind of enforcer type role, but those you know, those balls don't bobble about somebody's feet, you make the tackle or you make the foul, right. it breaks up the play and, and you reset and you start again. It just kind of bobbled about, frayed about. As a result, County were able to get the ball in over the top, which led to the corner, and then we've not really defended the, the corner properly. However, this stage in the season, new centre-half partnership, you know, it, it doesn't sound like, like County... The highlights are hard to tell from, but it doesn't sound like County had many moments. If they are going to score, it's probably from such moments. And yeah, it's it's one of those things. As long as we get better at it as the season goes on, that's the main thing. We've got away, we've got away beating Saturday. One interesting point: Kyogo, Yakovie, both attempted knee slides, both <laughs> nearly broke their kneecaps Aye. into the turf, went flying, no. lads. Too early in the season yeah. for that. Well, Wait till October. Well, just Wait till October. August, that's, a, that's a tip for August. August grass isn't uh, yep. particularly helpful to the, the old knee slide. But I'll show you something. The park will be kept dry to yep. stop us playing our game as well. So, no, no, middle I hate with lads. Same old Ross County, <laughs> Paddy. <laughs> Same old Ross County. Um, you'd mentioned, Miff, so obviously um, teams like Ross County, they're going to try their luck when it comes to set pieces. That's their biggest chances against teams like Celtic. And obviously they've, they've scored one from the corner. Not long after that, they've got a dangerous free kick. I think Jens again at fault as such. He's, he's taken the yellow card that's been a... This guy might be through here, I'll take the yellow. I don't mind that. You know, it's... Uh, what do you call your man for Italy? Bonucci? Chiellini. 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 All these uh, characters. Uh, they, they did, make you, a, did you funnel see enough, Did you see his... Yes, I did. His oh, handball. His handball. Brilliant. Amazing. The most cynical of defenders, but you would take him all day long because oh, he knows absolutely. when to do it and when not. So, yep. So, Maurice Jens taking a leaf out of uh, Chiellini's book. Taking the yellow card, fine. Free kick in the edge of the box. No, I'm not convinced by Celtic's wall. I think it's gone through the wall and it's hard to tell how that's happened. But it's a huge save from Joe Hart because at that stage in the game, it's one each. You're taking a bit of a, a dip, you know, just by nature of conceding that equaliser. If Celtic had gone 2-1 down at that stage, Paddy, it'd have been a long way back. Yeah, it, it, it would have been. It's 
it's obviously it was a a vital point of the game and and like you say that the heads probably are down a, a little bit but I, I I don't know if this team knows when they're down to be honest though you know and I think that not to say that I would like to have seen that I would like I, I would like to see how they would react to something like that um, because one each is fine but going going behind no one likes to go behind but we were very very quick last season and righting those wrongs if we if we did go behind to any of the games. Um, so I, I think that mentality still continues. I still wouldn't worry too much. Yeah. Uh, you're right, it'd have been interesting. I mean, you wouldn't choose to go 2-1 no, no, down, no, no. but I said, we'll <laughs> face adversity at some point, you know, potentially domestically, certainly both of some tough challenges in Europe. So we'll maybe get to see that, Paddy. Just to touch on that point, though, that, that's the, the template for a, a championship winning team in the sense that your, your keeper making big saves at big moments. You're not going to serenely just go through the season without conceding chances and that, I agree with you Jens has probably been a bit cute there he's, he's realised he's not the last man guys just outside the box it's a good yell to take the the save is, is an excellent save big save at a big time from a, a, a big name goalkeeper yeah and that's the job of a Celtic goalkeeper isn't it you might have nothing to do for most of the game and then all of a sudden you're, you're called into action and it's it's at times like that when a Joe Hart steps up where a Barkas potentially didn't for example yeah. Anyway, moving, <laughs> moving forward. In terms of the substitutions, I thought it was interesting how Ange played that on Saturday. So he often rings three changes around about the hour mark and then a couple up, you know, 75, 80 minutes, whatever it may be. He's only gone with three subs over the piece. So Abada came in for Maeda at half time after he picked up that knock. Jack Amakis came in for Turnbull um, and sat a wee bit deeper, but effectively behind Kyogo. And Aaron Moy came on at the end, potentially see out the game. That leaves you know various guys on the bench, like Sir James Forrest, Bernabai, and, and others not getting involved at all. What do you think of that approach, Muff? Is it just horses for courses? You know, is he taking just the right moves at the right time? Well, for for Bernabai, you can't put him on for play of the year, so, so that's silly. Um, but <laughs> with regards to Forrest, I mean, for, Forrest down the pecking order. I don't. If Shota has justified staying on the park by showing his quality, it, it's that's what a squad's for. You know, Forrest said it be called upon as and when needed, but he wasn't needed. Um, no, for me, I don't think there's too much to see there. I think it's just the, the changes work. Yeah, and Aaron Moy very quickly being favoured over James McCarthy, Paddy. Yeah, I mean, there's there's obviously been a few few um, grumbles for Celtic part that it's uh, it's maybe looking like all, but both parties might just want to try and end this this deal with James McCarthy. So I wonder if it's possibly that that's what they're, they're thinking. Well, if he's not. If he's not going to be part of the plans here, then then Moy needs to go in. You know, needs to get the the minutes under his belt. But we're kind of hoping that that would have been the same for for Idaguchi uh, before picking up the injury. Um, but I, I think only going with like the three substitutions, it's okay to do that just now on the basis that you know we're getting this week in between games. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to two two games a week and quick succession, I think obviously we'll see a huge bit of rotation then. Um, I wonder if we do start to see maybe a change in the lineups in that basis, just to try and keep the rest of the players up to speed and just just be ready. Obviously, we, Turnbull comes in for an injured Tati at the weekend, and that'll be good. Uh, good some minutes under his belt as well. And but yeah, the, the likes of Forrest, um, even the likes of Moy as well. That like it's it's up to them to push and keep pushing and just make sure that they're, they're ready to come into the team. But for McCarthy, yeah, I, I don't know what the drill will be there. Um, I think it's going to be very hard to shift him I if think, we are going to if we are going to sell him. Yeah, I think he's on good money, yeah. and I think he's still got three years of a four-year deal to go. <laughs> so everything needs to be right for that to happen. I can't see anybody in Scotland being able to make that work for James McCarthy, and I wonder if it's a move back down to probably the Championship down uh, there. But what I, I mentioned it last week, I think his stock is high given what he achieved in, in English football. But yeah, we'll see what happens. I think Aidan McGarry was speaking during the week about having bumped into James McCarthy and the suggestion is he wants to go and play football and it doesn't look like it's going to happen at Celtic. The only other confusion regarding that and the future of Mikey Johnson, you might have read, is that as part of Celtic's 25-man Champions League squad, if I've got my details right here, you need to have four club-trained players, i.e. they need to have played in your academy for, I think, three years and you need to have a further four Scottish trained players so guys like Greg Taylor who was trained at Kilmarnock is fine James McCarthy who was trained at Hamilton Ackies for example and I believe if Mikey Johnson and McCarthy are allowed to move on Celtic so give a gap there that they need to fill so there's maybe just a wee bit more to it and it might explain why the two of them are still around at the moment but, but we'll see what happens in terms of going back to the game against Ross County so 
generally speaking, we've covered it. It's a difficult venue to go to, and there's no doubt, Paddy, as you've mentioned, that they've improved under Malcolm Mackay over the last 12 months or so. Um, we are back there in a few weeks' time, so we're up there on the 31st of August in the League Cup, and then we're not back there until the 1st of April uh, in terms of the, the league stuff. And you'll be happy enough, Miff, to be going back there at that time of the year rather than maybe a, a heavy December or January, won't you? Yes, yes, you would. Um, it's, those trips are always a... <clears throat> no, I was going to say a nightmare, but maybe not for the guys that were there on Saturday. I don't think <laughs> it would have been too much a nightmare. I mean, bottle of tonic at half seven. Um, <laughs> but yes, y- you'd, you'd rather go up there at the, the fairer time of the, the season. Albeit, I believe midges can sometimes be a problem at that, that time of the year. Um, Take your word for it. The, <laughs> I remember, I remember once going to Inverness and it got, it got snowed off and um, we were in Kingussie, I think we went to, and because you hadn't actually been to the game, oh, what a condition, man. <laughs> but because we, 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 the game got called off just as we were driving up to the stadium. But anyway, sorry, <laughs> slight tangent there. Um, the, I, the, nothing domestically should hold any fears for us. Mm-hmm. Regardless of what time of the year it is, but but I take your point. Sometimes playing games slightly back to back can be a bit more awkward. Um, but I would imagine the team that plays on that occasion will be very different to the team that played on Saturday. Yeah, very probably. Paddy, overall, though, please take it down the road with the three points. Ah, uh, excellent. Um, and just to continue a good solid start. Um, they're warming up. It's, we're nowhere near watching what we, we watched last year and I think that that will come but my god some of the goals were scored already are brilliant yeah and I, th- I think you're right the momentum's slowly building we're, yeah. we're far from at our best but there's positive signs there and, and we're ticking along before we continue with this week's show I wanted to let all of our listeners know that our premium subscription service the Celtic Exchange Plus is now up and running the Celtic Exchange Plus allows you to access even more podcast shows from us throughout the month including pre and post match shows for every Celtic game our exclusive Celtic Relived series, special episodes with coaches, journalists and ex-Celtic players and much, much more. We're offering all new listeners a free seven-day trial, which you can sign up for now at theceliticexchange.supercast.com and our weekly choice will remain free and available here on your podcast player of choice. But if you'd like to enjoy our exciting new range of shows and to make sure you don't miss any of the action as the new Celtic season gets underway, then just visit theceliticexchange.supercast.com to start your free trial today. Moving on, Matt, we're going to have a wee look at the, the transfer front and it all seems a wee bit quiet there just now, so we've got a bit over three weeks to go and I do th- you know, think there's still a strong chance we'll see some ins and outs between now and the 1st of September. I had a good conversation with Anthony Joseph from Sky Sports News on Friday last week about the transfer window so far and you can hear that now actually at the Celtic Exchange Plus as Anthony gave us the inside track on Celtic's business so far. That aside, Miff, we've not made any signings since Aaron Moy and Maurice Yens were announced a couple of weeks back there on the 21st of July. And on that note, would you be happy if we went into the season with the squad as is or do you think that further improvement is still needed? I think further improvement is still needed and no, I wouldn't be happy um, if we went in. Not, not to say that I think there's any major deficiencies in the squad. I think part of continual improvement is, is just looking at areas where you need to tighten up and I think, I think it is fairly obvious there's a couple of gaps in the squad, to me anyway. Um, injuries recently have shown us that. The uncertainty about McCarthy uh, is, is is probably highlighting that as well because if you feel McCarthy settled and going to be used and had had a solid pre-season, you'd be sitting here going, no, but we're, we're well covered in the six because of the good she'll come back and he'll, he'll compete with that as well. However, the simple fact of the matter is he hasn't. McCarthy doesn't seem to be in the plans and the good she's injured. We've seen Darren Moy, who's severely lacked in game time, Another robust midfielder for me would be an obvious one because I don't think Moy's naturally a six either. I think he would ideally want to play a wee bit further up the park. So that's an obvious one for me and, and potentially a striker like as well still. I feel, you know, if, if Jack and Marcus or Kilgo get injured, then the burden's left on one player because Ajeti's the invisible man. So that, that that's the obvious ones for me. Um, I know there's been a few links recently which I'll, I'll let you go into, you know. But yeah, I would I would be disappointed if we don't sign anyone else, yes. I, I'm in total agreement with you in terms of where the gaps are. I think it's definitely number six. I'm not convinced that Moy is in there to offer that genuine competition for Callum McGregor. I think Moy's a bit of a utility midfielder. I think he'll be hugely beneficial to have around throughout the season. But I'm not sure he's that genuine competition or assistance, you know, to, to Callum McGregor. And I do think we're light up top. You're absolutely right. It's very 
possible or, or there's a big potential that Kyogre Giacomakis could take a knock at any given time, you know, training wise or, or during a game or whatever. And that leaves you very, very light. We've all agreed that Maeda is not a nine. So, you know, it's, I don't think there's an argument to say that, oh, he can step in and cover. He's at his best when he's on the wing and that's where he's been most effective. So I, I agree, Miff. I think we're, we're light at six and there's still a gap there in the forward areas. So in terms of the, the players that have been linked this week, and, and links are quite quiet just now, and that's not a bad thing. You know, Celtic in recent times have just, it's been quiet, and then they've, they've announced Sunday, which is always nice to see. But Ross Barkley from Chelsea um, has been quoted this morning as a possibility. Talented guy in his day, but his career looks to have kind of dipped a wee bit, Paddy. Uh, and there's also a, a young forward from Marseille, Bamba Dieng. He's a Senegalese striker. I think he's 22, and I think he plays through the middle or on the wing. I don't know much about him, Paddy. I don't know if you do, but thoughts in general on that and, and Ross Barkley? Barkley, for me, I mean, we're saying maybe he's, he's had had his day. He's, he's 28. It could be a move for, for something, someone like uh, Ross Barkley to try and, and, and get himself up to the levels that he was thought to reach. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people put a lot of... Uh, Hope into him being, you know, the replacement for the likes of Gerard and and uh, Lampard when they kind of started to come off the scene at England, and um, it's never really worked out for him. Um, and he's kind of sat at the sides at at, at, uh, at Chelsea too long now. Um, do I think it will happen? Probably not. Um, I I think because of his age, as a move up here, he'll probably want a, a really decent wage. And I just, we've, we've, I think we've maybe made that mistake with McCarthy. Mm. Um, and I just don't think it's a move that will happen. Would I want it to happen? Yeah, I would take Ross Barkley. I don't think there would be many, be many yeah. would say that they wouldn't. He's split up in, you know, a wee bit online, and as you know, Twitter is the, the barometer of all things sensible. <laughs> um, there's a lot of kind of turn and throw in there. I, I certainly, I've not seen much, I don't think anyone's seen much of him in recent times, but you've seen over the years that he's a talented player, Muff. I just wonder, though, if it's a non-starter, because he'll be on big dough down there, yeah. and he's at 28... You've maybe got one big move left in you and I don't think you come to Celtic and take a big, big cut. If it was purely for football reasons, to play under Ange, to play in the Champions League, then you would. But I just think that's it's not the way it works. So I don't know, do you think that's maybe dead in the water, Miff? Yes, purely down to finances. Um, would I want us to sign Ross Bartley? Yes, I think he's a very talented footballer. I think um, he's somebody with Champions League experience. Fits the bill. Um in terms of that kind of big name signing that you would probably want to just build a wee bit of momentum mm-hmm. going into the Champions League um, group stages. So for me, that all makes sense. Alone for him, he probably wouldn't want that. I agree with that. He'd probably want a, a move, a bit of security, but I'm assuming that. Who knows? I don't personally know Ross Bartley. Roscoe, um, you don't know? I see he's also sporting a perm as well. Mm. No so keen in that. Um, a mullet next. So that's what all the... Edinburgh boys are doing shaving up the sides and growing them all in the tash. Horrendous. They rugby boys. <laughs> um, but the it, it just doesn't feel like it makes sense to me. Aye. Much like the McCarthy move didn't make sense to me, <laughs> to be honest. Um, it, it feels a wee bit off. Is he going to come in and be... To, to me, he would be like a, a slightly better David Turnbull, almost like that. He would, he'd be seeing him doing that sort of creative role should you not be trying to develop Turnbull, Turnbull more than, than bringing him in and exposing Turnbull to the Champions League that would be my argument on that that specific role um, but as a as a signing I think he comes in and he makes your first eleven better quite mm. simple there was a curveball thrown at us in response on Twitter in terms of there's various Chelsea players who haven't been given a squad number for the season ahead one of which is Billy Gilmore um, Gilly Gilmore that's the man <laughs> would you take a guy like that buddy? He won far less wages, of course, than Bartley. Talented guy, fits in very well for Scotland. Don't think his mum is a big fan of the Celtic. Mm. Uh, that was quite quite obvious when he signed for Norwich and she wasn't f- fond of the green scarf. I, I wasn't expecting this question. Mm. However, what I will say is, when McGregor and Gilmore play together for Scotland, they complement each other excellently. That was mentioned, there's a relationship there. So, what about it, Paddy? Uh, oh. I, I don't know. Your green tinted specs saying I'm not. No, having. it's not a case of that. I'm not. I'm not that bad. <laughs> so what is that case of? I don't know. I just I, <laughs> explain yourself. I, I would have to say that I don't see. I don't see where that that fits in our in our system. I think he's a very good player, but I think it would be if we were to go for someone at like a six and move McGregor forward. Then where does that? I, I don't know if that partnership happens in our midfield. Do you know? Do you know what I mean? Like. And he's not going to change. He's not going to change the formation. 
I, I wasn't expecting this. I, I, I need to say this just came as a bit of a shock to me, but I, I labelled him Berlin Esther. Berlin Esther. Berlin Esther. <laughs> just because he's got, uh, he's just got such great poise on on the ball. I know all about you know when he's come through the ranks and mm-hmm. his mum seen a few things about that on you know she obviously is no fan of Celtic that's that's fair to say however eh, would would he improve her team I think he would I think so he would. I think he would but I can't that, that's just not going to happen I, yeah. I, I doubt it I doubt the lad he's a good player but I don't think that again you talk about a fit is that going to fit I, I don't I don't think so maybe I don't not. think so maybe not uh, last curveball for you Miff. so another one which is been reported today is that your old favourite Jack Henry has fallen out of favour at Club Bruges. <laughs> you having him back? Absolutely not. <laughs> You've been quite vocal in your uh, what's the word? I don't know. You're not a fan, put it that way. Is that seriously? Yeah. That... Apparently, he's he's out of the picture at Bruges. Much as he had a decent season last season, played Champions League for them, he's not in the picture now. I don't know if there's been a change behind the scenes, but it seems that he's looking for a new club. Someone's found that clip at uh, Farhill. And just being like that, who's this guy? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, listen, fair point him because yeah. he went he went to Belgium and he clearly improved himself to get that move. I absolutely, you know, I, I have nothing personal against him. I just think he's short of the the standard required, and I, and I, he is someone I don't feel would improve our squad if he came back. I think you're right. A couple of other talking points. Um, one on field, one off field, as such. Yeah, again, might have read this part today. John Kennedy's been linked with the, the vacant managerial job at Michelland. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Sviachenko's club, obviously Celtic played them in qualifiers last year. And I don't know if, if that's paper talk or not, I really don't know. It's, it's an interesting link, it's a bit out there. Um, but what do you think, Matt? I, I don't get the vibe that John Kennedy's going to be tempted away anytime soon. I think he'll enjoy developing under Ange. I think he's part of an exciting something at Celtic just now. But at some point he may go alone, alone but do you see that happening? Where are you getting all this from? I just make it up, Miff. I just spin it off my, <laughs> oh, my own head and throw it out at you guys and see what happens. Um, John Kennedy. Have you got the internet at home? You get the you get the web? John Kennedy it's got all the there. Denmark. Where was it? Town Courts went? Hungary? Aye. I didn't even know that. Where are you getting that from? That's fact. <laughs> fact. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't see it, but good luck to him if he does. Obviously, Sweet Chinko's the obvious link there. Um, but I, I would be surprised... I'd be surprised if it, like, I think something's building at Celtic and, mm-hmm. and he's been around the club long enough to know yeah. you know different eras when there's a bit of momentum behind the club and, and how great that can be he's played on, on the big nights we've had at Celtic Park in Europe he's played in the Champions League um, I would be surprised if he did it but if he, if he does go then, then all the best to him because we, we can't argue with the, the service he's given us yeah definitely so that's all the, the curveballs for today if you'd be glad to know you can Relax a wee bit. On the, on the see, defensive a wee bit. No, the, the Billy Gilmore man, that, that's nah, not going to happen. Man. I doubt a it. Wee, see, wee. if he did have to go, Kennedy, mm-hmm. would he not be better off trying the managerial journey eventually in order to try and, and maybe come back to us as a manager? Would that maybe not be the, the thinking behind that? Because I'd like to see it. I'd like to see it. I don't see the jump from assistant manager to manager. I think that's just too much for for uh, for anyone. I, think, honest, yeah. I know it happens, but... Quite a natural progression would be go out the way to come back in the way mm-hmm. and it might be that he goes and develops himself somewhere. There's just there's huge risk for a guy like John Kennedy and others in his position because so he was touted for the Hibs job, for example, before Maloney got it. And he could have left a very comfortable position at Celtic where he's you know very highly respected and valued, got to Hibs for three, four months, like Maloney, found himself out a job and no job back at Celtic. Aye. And that's a huge risk for a guy with a, a life and a family and a mortgage and, and everything that goes with it. Hibs absolutely kippered Maloney. <laughs> <laughs> punt it boil, punt it boil, and then brought him back. I know. Oh man, he's clearly their best player. <laughs> yeah, as yesterday showed. Absolute nonsense. Last wee bit of transfer chat as such, it's it's going the other way. So Chris Julian, he's now failed to make either of our first two match day squads, even though Stephen Welsh is missing. So Welsh is out the picture and Julian can't get in. He must surely be looking to get away, Paddy. I, absolutely. I thought you were going to talk about Alan McGregor not being number one for Rangers and, and maybe he was worth a shout there. Not interesting. Maybe yeah. Your rumours have went tonight, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Julian, time to go. Time to go. 100%. Should have happened already. Yeah, it sounds when it, it sounds like when it's come to the Schalke move that 
he's put the brakes on it somewhere Aye. and whether that's for financial reasons or whatever it may be but surely a guy like Atmuth and, and I'll throw Albion a Yeti into that bracket as well surely at this stage they just want to go and play games of football Listen, you would expect so but um, who, who, who knows that they'll have their own motivations and ultimately you just need to stand back and say right, well if you're looking after your family that, that's all that really matters but um, we, we surely end I think there's an element of, of ego there where he's not been part of the squad last season. He's let that be known. Um, he looks like he could potentially be a disruptive influence. I'm, I'm completely speculating there, but judging by his mannerisms and his body language pre season, I can completely understand why he's not in match day squads. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Despite his experience and despite him potentially being useful coming off the bench. Um, it doesn't surprise me that he's not involved. Yeah, he's well out of the picture. So we'll see what happens with guys like him and Ayeti moving forward. Um, before we're going to talk about Kamarnock, uh, I picked up an interesting quote from Greg Taylor, uh, who was speaking after the game on Saturday. So he says, The system the gaffer has put in place it is, is designed in such a way that as long as everyone does their small bit, we'll look at our best. It's hard work. It's not an easy way to play football. But if you get it right, it's certainly the most enjoyable. And I think, Miff, I'll obviously always come to you when it comes to Greg Taylor. I can see the, the love hearts in your eyes. Greg Taylor's as good an example as any of players who have thrived under Ange. But what I think's interesting is that before Ange arrived at Celtic, everyone spoke about how he was gung-ho. He was all attack, all about going forward, all about that kind of cavalier style of play. But if anything, Miff, I think it's defensive players like Taylor, like Ralston, like Carter Vickers, and even Joe Hart as a, as a goalkeeper behind the defence, who have potentially made the biggest improvements under Ange. Absolutely, and I would include uh, Carol Starfield in that as well, based mm-hmm. on his, his end to the season last season. Um, one thought that jumped into my head there is, if Greg Taylor can play for Celtic, and probably Bill, Billy Gilmore can as well, but that's maybe a different <laughs> story for a different day. Um, Taylor has, has thrived, I think where you have to applaud Taylor the most, clearly he's a fit guy, right? So if you play, if you play professional football, you need to be fit. And Lee Griffiths. Different players will achieve different levels of fitness well that, that's an example because he's someone who could have knuckled down got fit scored himself some goals but he chose to go up to some other activities but with, with Greg Taylor he's obviously embraced the challenge because it was something different and I know listen we've spoken about this before you know he's a bit of a pet of mine as well but with, with Taylor what's underlooked with him is his quality on the ball or how that's improved he was really nervy especially the start of last season when he was asked to play that, he was getting the ball, he was back to go in midfield and you could see he's like, please don't give me this ball in here. Mm-hmm. However, he's clearly been coached to embrace that. Mm-hmm. He himself has adopted an attitude to embrace it. So it's twofold. It's the manager clearly saying, I can work with you and I can make you better. But it's the player embracing it mm-hmm. and saying, being open-minded enough to have that mindset to say, I-, I want to do this. What he's then found is, he's picking the ball up, he's spraying passes, switching play, he's, get, he's playing intricate passes, he's waiting in overlaps when he would normally be the guy over Lamb, it's just completely changed the way he's, he's looking at the game. You can also see he, he's playing with such enthusiasm. At times, he he and Ralston and Juranovic as well are actually driving the team on yeah. by the way that they play, by the way the system is. That They're just battling so hard for each other. It's just great to see. And the, uh, one of my mates was Joel, um, my mate Gary and Conan, the two of them have... Uh, been listening to podcasts oh, gents uh, and they said you'll need to raise the fact that uh, Taylor could maybe play at number 6 in, in the midfield and I, and I my retort to that was I think I've already mentioned in the podcast he's the best centre mid that we've got mm. because that's effectively the position that he's, that he's, he's picking up uh. in um, whether, whether a, a, a longer term experiment in midfield would work I don't know maybe I'm getting a bit giddy just at how his early season form has been but I think the point is worth noting that the improvement, yes, fitness levels, absolutely. Playing the in- inverted fullback role, absolutely. But I think it's the quality on the ball that's improved the most. It's a hundred percent improved. You can just you can just see that the eye test tells you that. You know, let alone the stats. Um, Paddy, I think again to lead on from this point, when it comes to to playing with an Angie system, it's a two way street. Angie will make you a better player if you listen to his instruction. But as a player, you've got to buy into that. And I think. You've seen the buy-in from Taylor and Ralston being the, the biggest and best examples. And I think under Ange, you're, just, you're either all in or you're all out. Yeah. And I think maybe Chris Julian, maybe Albina Yeti, maybe Ball and Goalie, Barkas, it wasn't for them for whatever reason. They didn't want to embrace. That was a real chance for them to revive their Celtic careers freshly under Ange. And for different reasons, these guys have not embraced it, but Taylor absolutely has. 
the ball and goalie one's possibly a wee bit harsh because he did play once and did well. He did. But, but, but again, I, I think it's possible that just his card's been marked. Aye. Mm-hmm. I think he was basically told, you'll go, you'll go when we get rid of you type of thing after everything that happened with him. Um, yeah, I, I, I can see what you're saying. I, I think it's, it's definitely... The ones that are buying into it, the ones that are starting, the ones that are part of the match day squads, and that they're they're putting everything into it, and it's kind of going back to what we were saying. We've, we've spoke about the the rotation in, in, of the team and how crucial it's, it's going to be for us, and to have a squad harmony where you you literally have a squad of twenty already willing, wanting to play for the team, is very impressive. You know, I don't think you get a lot of teams in football that can can pull that off, yeah. in my opinion. So. I think you can you can see the enthusiasm Aye. throughout the team and, and Taylor leads leads from the front when it comes to that. You know, when anybody scores a goal, he's often one of the first guys there and you can just see that that spirit there, can't you, within the dressing room? It's spirit, it's confidence from him as well. It really is. He's starting to believe in himself. Um the ability, um the ability has, has definitely improved for Greg Taylor. But I think a lot of that has been enabled by just having more confidence in himself and exactly what you're talking about, Miff. Just been take, been able to take the, the ball in tighter positions. He's thriving on it now. He's looking for the ball down the line instead of trying to go back the way. And I, I swear to God, we've spoke about this many times last season. The amount of teams that try and play the ball in behind him, he wins every header. He wins every header, and I think he's he's really come on leaps and bounds. And I'll definitely hold my hands up for him. Um, I still like to see the the wee man Bernabe come in and 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 push him and push him and push him because I just think that's what's made Juranovic play so well when he's in the team and it's definitely what's, what's making Anthony and Alisson continue to get better as well um, so it's only a good thing for us Yeah I think just every time we speak about Taylor if I glance up and I see you sitting there like a proud father with the, like, <laughs> I see the glistening of a tear forming in your eyes you're just you're delighted aren't you? What a guy What a okay. guy indeed So let's take a look now at that fixture against Kilmarnock at the weekend so Celtic head to Rugby Park for match day three in the Scottish Premiership and we play newly promoted Kilmarnock Derek McInnes' side, they're still looking for their first league win of the season. They've drawn one and lost one eh, of their two games so far. Paddy, a difficult surface, a stuffy opponent. It's probably not going to be, you know, vintage football, is it? No, the return of Kyle Lafferty as well. It's going to just be elbows everywhere, isn't it? Um, I think we're a better team. Um, and I do think we'll have, a, we'll have too much for them. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Lafferty there, I think... You know, Kill have made a couple of signings and obviously they're, they're newly promoted as I mentioned there but by and large they carry a lot of players who seem to have just been around forever in Scottish football you know Scottish football journeymen to use that term guys like Kyle Lafferty absolutely Alan Power Ash Taylor who's now there after his stint at Aberdeen Rory McKenzie they just kind of feel like the same club as they've been for <laughs> did, years did Power go to St Man? and he's now back is yeah. he back? It's McInnes, Park, De- Derek McInnes has got the Power McInnes Aye. that park Aye. Lafferty <laughs> Are <laughs> <laughs> you excited for it, Muff? Well, the only thing we were speaking about the man, Greg Taylor, um, at least he's somebody that will be off okay with that particular mm-hmm. pitch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, historically, we've struggled at places like Rugby Park in the past. Livy as well, you know, similar idea with the artificial surface. But, Paddy, do you think Angie's set us up in such a way that these games are maybe less the struggle that they used to be? I just think it kind of comes with uh, belief in, in yourself and being able to just to know, try and keep the ball down on the deck as much as possible. It's too many times, I think, under the likes of, like, uh, when this so, so-called so curse at, um, at uh, the spaghetti had kind of come up, I think a lot of people were kind of thinking it's all down to do with uh, just the, the belief in the team and whether, you know, they were going up against hatchet men, the part was slow. But the games against Levy last season, we blew them up. Well, we eventually started to just blow them away. They won James Forrest's goal, great goal. And I just think that they just need to know if we keep doing what we're doing, keep the ball on the deck, we are better, we are quicker than them. It slows the game down, there's no doubt about it. It won't be watered as well. It'll be a, a dry, sticky sticky part, but we're a better team and I just think that that's the mentality going into this game. Yeah. So you're saying no knee slides for Kyogo? No, not this one. Not Surely advisable. you just get the entire squad to go in the park with a full bottle of water and kid on their missing their mouth. It's a good shout. It's a good shout. Enough. That's that's why you're at the cutting edge of the. Some of the boys the were pointing out. Did you see what Fulham done? No. So obviously, I think Liverpool were saying that the park was quite dry on Saturday. Uh, after the two each draw, they put out a tweet. I think it was the following morning, and all the sprinklers are on. 
all over the park. <laughs> Morning, guys. I mean, it is what it is. Teams, uh, whether it's Fulham or Kelly or whoever it is, you've got to do all you can to get an advantage. And their job isn't to make life easy no, for us. No, and no, that's no, the way it's going all. to be. I'd mentioned if they drew their first game one each with Dundee United, I think, with a late equaliser. They get beat 2-0 at Ibrox uh, last week. And pressure will quickly start to mount if they don't start to pick up some points. So I would expect it'll be a backs to the wall damage limitation job for McInnes. Possibly. And McInnes, um, McInnes knows how to set up his teams. He's a, he's a good manager, mm-hmm. as much as it pains me to say it. Um, but the, the the fact is, Kelly, no, as a newly promoted team, they just need to try and get points on the board by any means necessary. If that means shutting up shop and, and defending against us. But what you, what you often find with, with teams is that they'll go through periods of the game where they will kind of come up and, and, and press you to try and, try and keep you in. Like Paddy says, it's... It, it's how we react to that. Do we re- retain our composure, trust the process, keep the ball, move it quickly? If you do those things, you will get your chances. That's that's what kind of turned the screw yeah. against Livingston. I, I happened to be at that game. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there is, when it comes up against a team with plastic pitch, there's always that wee bit of trepidation. Not necessarily because of any perceived curse or, or struggle that we've had before, just because, you know, you already know the type of pattern the game's going to have and that it's not necessarily going to be a great watch. I think that's more where it comes from, whereas when you know you're going to see Celtic, say at Celtic Park or a comparable park, you know they're going to play their stuff. These pitches tend to be a wee bit of a leveller, but but um, if we stick to our guns, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll get the victory. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be a pretty watch, Paddy, and if you could call it now, you would take one and back up the road, wouldn't you? Yeah, I happily, happily. Um as I say, that they're, they're, they're always just a slow game to watch when it's on these parks. Um, I still say that they should be nowhere near a top flight uh, league. Um, but I get that it brings in revenue, but the league should be looking at a way to kind of making sure that that doesn't have to be the case. It shouldn't be allowed. Yeah. But if you're the man on form when it comes to scoreline predictions, what are you giving it for Sunday? 2 0. Safe. Paddy? 2 0. Got it in my notes, I'll show you after. I've gone 2 0 as well. Aye. Boring as it may seem, it just kind of seems that kind of game, doesn't it? So, three 2 0s, uh, an aggregate of 6 0. 2 0 for all of us. Um, my final thoughts you're another week older, another week wiser. Any final thoughts for the week? Um, any final thoughts for the week? No, I think uh, just more of the same. Please, it, I was actually speaking to a guy in work today just about how unusual it is not having the two games a week. Um, in, in some ways, as much as you bemoan it at the time, you probably feel it always a wee bit more cohesion and a bit of oil on the, the wheels with the fact that you're yeah. playing so regularly. So uh, you would maybe have seen a wee bit more rotation in, in that case as well. So you would have seen more players featured. But on the whole, I think it's, I definitely would prefer to be in our position where we've only got the one game a week just now. The team's fairly settled, seems to be hitting a rhythm and hopefully that continues on Sunday. Yeah, Andrew was asked after the game actually about about that, about having another week to prepare, actually eight days between Saturday there and Sunday coming. And was it a good chance to rest and recuperate the players? And he said, it's not about that. It's more about just getting everyone more up to speed, you know, still working with the system. Yeah. For a lot of guys, it's still new. It's brand new for guys like Maurice Jens and um, Bernabai and other guys that are just learning how this all works. And I think for Ange, this is his dream scenario. You know, he didn't have the luxury of it last year. And he's now got the opportunity to to just go and spend time with these players and, and make those improvements. So, Paddy, I mean, generally speaking, very steady start to the season. Two wins from two. Can't do any better than that. Are you looking forward to what lies in store over the next couple of months? I, I can't wait. And it's kind of just touching on that same point as well. It's You remember a lot of the times he was getting interviewed at um, games probably around right about February, March. And just talking about, I'm not getting enough time with him on the, the training park. And... Um, we're getting that now, and and it's you know God. If we thought last season was good, and we we a lot will say that we kind of overachieved with a team and the transition that happened. I cannot wait to see this settled team with this full amount of training, full pre season, and then when the two games start coming, that's when we're going to see the benefits of everything. Um, so no, it's, and and when he sorry when he has to tweak something, if he does have to tweak any of the system, it's not going to take long. It's not going to take. A huge amount of time. Um, it's, it's very exciting. I agree. I think there could be some really exciting times ahead. So another week, another Celtic win and another man of the match display from Jota. Next up it's Kilmarnock as the Portuguese winger and his teammates target a third league win of the season this weekend. Thanks to Miff and Paddy for joining me on today's show and thanks to you as always for tuning in. 
Don't forget to visit the CelticExchange.supercast.com to begin your free seven day trial of the Celtic Exchange Plus and to access all of our new shows. But in the meantime, from all of us here, thanks for listening.